from the time I was blessed enough to become the coach at Texas Tech, I had uh, visions of us doing great things, and mainly because we were surrounded by such great high school basketball, and there was a great junior college conference that was around us, and I felt like that, you know, you had an opportunity to put great players in the program. One thing that I remember was everybody saying, Texas Tech, who is that? Um, Lubbock, where is Lubbock, Texas? And we were just a bunch of little girls from West Texas that no one had ever heard of. The one thing that stood out to me was how many girls were from Texas and, and how many of the players were from West Texas. 10 out of 12 people from, from on the team that year were, were from with a 100 mile radius of Lubbock. It was a time when the best fundamentals in women's basketball were being taught in the Panhandle and in West Texas. We felt like that the way that they had coached those kids in high school was, was similar to what we wanted the, our team to look like at Tech. They sold the fact of we are a rising program. A lot of people started asking me, why do you want to go to Tech? I kind of asked Chris about it, and she was like, well, Kim, I want to go to Tech because I know that down the road that we can be one of those teams that start to knock the other teams off that have been up there for so long, and she said, no, I want to be a part of that. Lyndon Weiss, Roger Redding, and, and Coach Sharp had done such a good job of recruiting West Texas and getting the best players there. Uh, they were able to get Cheryl Swoops, but the supporting cast around Cheryl Swoops was, was an amazing group of young ladies. Yeah, there might be more athletic kids or more physically talented players down in Houston, down in Desa They weren't getting the coaching. They didn't have the background. They didn't have the history that you had going back 30 years or more in some of these small panhandle towns and South Plains towns. We really tried to go out and find the best in West Texas and try to convince them that it was West Texas against the world whenever we went and played games and I think they kind of bought into that. That's what made the championship season so memorable for a lot of people from Lubbock is that you grew up watching a lot of these girls play high school basketball. You felt like you knew them, you felt like you were a part of the program and it was a feeling like no one's ever had uh, when you look at at Texas Tech Athletics. To win a national championship and to do it with young women who were from your area, uh, it was such a good feeling. We were very intelligent girls. We knew that if they can't stop our first option, why would we go to a second option? Cheryl Swoops was the most dominant player in women's college basketball. Swoops. Oh, Cheryl is as good as any female that I have seen in women's basketball. And I'm talking Cheryl Miller, Lynette Woodard. I'm talking about the greats of the game. Swoops with a turnaround and she's on fire. For a while, I, I don't think there's any question Cheryl was the best player in the world. One of the best to ever play. She did everything. It, it seemed to her effortless because it was just smooth and she was so athletic. And Nobody uh, liked her and really I haven't seen anybody like her since. In my opinion, she was, she was the greatest female player that I have ever seen. No doubt about it. I'd like to thank the WBCA and champion for like to me and the community here, it means a lot to me. Thank you. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, she had it. Uh, she was amazing. It's one thing to have the talent, then it's another thing to develop it. It's another thing to live with it every day the way she had to at that level and know, by and large, we'll go as far as I go on a national scene. First of all, she's a tremendous athlete. And second thing, she's a great competitor. I have coached players who are as good athletes as Cheryl, but I have never coached one that had the mentality that whatever it took to win, she was about that. She was never the diva, if you will. I mean, when it came down to practice, I guarantee you one thing, no one worked harder than she did. And I got to guard her every day during practice, and I think that's what made me the player that I ended up being, but uh, she worked so hard. She didn't make it um, all about her. And, I'm, and that's a lot of pressure, and that's, that's something that falls on great players, but she handled it. They believed in her so much, but she was also all about not letting them down. Teammates tend to get overlooked at times or overshadowed, but to me it was always bigger than me. It was about my team. None of us were jealous. None of us even thought about um, 
you know, saying that we were just a one-man team even. I mean, I know we got that a lot that year. I remember answering that question a ton about her, you know, being the one, but but she was so gracious and of us and knowing that she had to have us if we were going to win this team sport. Somebody had to make the passes. Somebody had to play defense. Somebody had to be good enough to demand being guarded on the perimeter or in the post. You know, all those things had to happen in order for her to have the ability to do what she did. And it, it's all too easy to forget what was going on around her. And her understanding of that and the rest of the team's understanding of, of I hate to say role players because it sounds like it denigrates what they did, and it, it wasn't. They all had an equal job. She just got the points because she was really good at that. Everyone talked about the other school. Everyone talked about the University of Texas. There were a few hurdles that the Lady Raiders needed to get over uh, during the 1992-93 season. One of those hurdles was beating Texas at Texas. The Lady Raiders had lost to Texas the first time they played in Lubbock. They, they dropped that heartbreaker at home against Texas. Block charge call. You've got the tape. Go back, look at it. I thought it was a late call to be a, to be a block, but um, you know, I really thought we'd get a call on our own court. But we had plenty of times to, um, to pull ahead, you know, and we didn't, so we can't really blame it on that last play. We stood in the locker room after that loss. And Coach Sharp just looked us, I mean, we were all upset, we were crying, devastated. Again, the expectation was there, and she said, we have got to do everything we can not to feel this way again. I thought it was certainly a turning point. It was certainly one of those times where we looked at each other in the eyes after that game and said, mm, it's not happening again. That created a fire, and then they started knocking people off, not, not just winning games, destroying opponents. We were beating teams by 25 and 30 points. Teams that were incredible basketball teams. I don't think any team's going to win the conference without one loss at least. So, you know, we'll hopefully we'll learn something from this. We will be ready to play when we go to Austin. The girls were as loose as they'd ever been before a game. And I knew then that that's a good sign. They weren't nervous about playing in Austin. You know, we are not leaving the Frank Irvin Center um, defeated. And Marcia Sharp and the ninth-ranked Lady Raiders did so much more than beat one of the nation's best teams here Wednesday. They emphatically ended a 14-year drought by beating Texas for the first time ever in the Super Drunk. The Lady Raiders now know that they belong in the top 10, and they will never again have to take a back seat to Lady Longhorn basketball. At the time, lo looking back on it now, uh, of course it meant more to me. Um, not, not just because that was initially um, the school that I was going to go and play at, but more so of the fact that they were always the dominant team in the Southwest Conference. They were the team to beat. Anytime you can beat that quality of a program on their home court, I think it says a lot, of, it said a lot about our team that we had. After that, we realized there really wasn't a whole lot we could not conquer. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so on. It is so on. We can do this, we can do this, we can do this. That's when it kind of clicked. At that point, we were just like, I don't think we're going to get beat again. And it was just like a fantasy. That was the game where you really thought this team has a chance to do something on a national scale. They beat Texas in Austin. Um, now what can they do? Can they win a national championship? After the Lady Raiders won the Southwest Conference Tournament Championship, and the NCAA selections came out, and Texas Tech was a number two seed. That Washington game, it was close. Uh, Swoops ran into the gold standard at one point, banged her knee. You know, and she's like rolling on the floor and grabbing her knee, and I'm like thinking, oh crap. That was our first obstacle to, 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 I mean, to lose her for a second and to have to kind of come together and just play hard until she got back in the game. At halftime, you know, we were getting a little worried. <laughs> so Coach Shark came in and challenged us and, and we came out and we did a good job and, and, you know, got our composure back a little bit and just kept attacking and um, thank goodness it's not over yet. You know, we still have a long ways to go. I think that was, I think it was good that they had that first test that game because had they really sailed through it, then when you run into USC, when you run into whoever, when you get to Missoula, I think it might have been a little tougher. Southern Cal and Texas Tech, a matchup that may boil down to which team can cause the other's big gun to misfire. For the Trojans, it's a howitzer. 6'5 post player Lisa Leslie. I can remember Micah Atkins walking into my office and asking me if USC had a good post player. And I immediately went and found Cheryl and Krista and said, don't tell her about Lisa Leslie. I didn't let it get to me 
I would challenge myself to do my best. Here's Mike Atkins from Lorraine, Texas. Well, she's pretty tall. And she, you know, just puts nice little moves on her and goes score. I think USC was surprised at how aggressive Tech was that night. Uh, Tech got them back on their heels, and uh, the women of Troy just never really responded. It, it just, I think it floored them, the ability, the swiftness, the suddenness that Tech played at. Texas Tech was put in the same region with Stanford, and Stanford was the number one team in the nation. They had beaten Texas Tech the first game of the season. They had beaten Texas Tech the year before in the NCAA tournament. And everybody thinks there's going to be a regional final matchup with those two. When you're trying to win a national championship, you have to be very good, you have to be very lucky, and you have to be hot at the right time. And we were all of those things. We were a little bit lucky that Stanford got beat by Colorado in the semifinals. They were the defending national champion. And to have Colorado beat them, I mean, we were like, oh my gosh, wow, we just, we, we, can, we can beat Colorado. It would have been an interesting mental hurdle with Stanford, but when it was Colorado, again, that just, I think, kind of threw that off. They said, all right, we're just going to go play. You know, you can see, when you go back and look at the first half and, and stuff of that game, you can see that Texas Tech was definitely, I think, at a higher plane than what Colorado could gear up that night. Cheryl Sweet with two defenders in her face. Texas Tech is going to the Final Four. About two weeks ago, our goal was to go to the Final Four. About uh, 10 o'clock Saturday night, that changed. Our goal is to win the Final Four. Yeah! I didn't know what to expect from the Final Four, and I'm not sure any of the Lady Raiders did either. Well, the Final Four was an unbelievable experience, and uh, you know there were a lot of people in Atlanta that were supporting it. Tech quickly became the favorites of the Atlanta uh, community. Just the, the buzz and the intensity and the excitement, and so many people from Lubbock came to the game. Yes, it was the first Final Four in the history of women's basketball that had ever sold out. Semifinal day, I remember walking outside uh, to just look around the Omni. And the atmosphere outside the Omni was just like a men's Final Four. You know you've really arrived as a big time sport when for the first time tickets are being scalped for your event. That's what's been happening here outside the Omni Arena all morning. Scalpers selling women's basketball tickets outside of Lubbock, Texas. I mean, unheard of at a Final Four. We've mainly been ranked one most of the year and, and no one really gave us much of a chance to beat them. In, in the arena of athletics, sometimes it is terribly advantageous to be the underdog. There was a calmness about us. There was a, um, you know, we were just taking it in. We were enjoying the journey, which is what you always want your players to do. When we walked out on the court and looked behind our bench for our first game and saw the entire section, red and black. That was something to, to really behold. We just looked forward. We, we had blinders on and, and went into that first game against Vanderbilt. We had followed the game plan to a tee. Kirkland got some room and hits three. Nine point lead, largest of the game. Scott, good feed for Klinger. That's it. The Lady Raiders of Texas Tech from Lubbock, Texas are headed to the championship game. Yeah, we're walking off after we beat Vandy. Coach Ray goes, God dang. I said, what's the matter? He said, God, we got to work tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, history will be made as Texas Tech will play for their first national title ever. I think everybody who watched the semifinal games knew that Ohio State was going to be a, a more difficult test. And I can remember sitting and watching Ohio State and Iowa play the other semifinal game. And there somebody asked me, who do you want to win? I said, I don't care. I just hope they keep playing. They just need to use their legs up as much as they can for the, for the championship day. I think everybody who watched the semifinal games knew that Ohio State was going to be a, a more difficult test. They had a freshman in Katie Smith who was an amazing basketball player. A lot of people compared her to Larry Bird. They had the best freshman in the country. Really didn't matter because we had the best player in the country. To me, there's no comparison. I mean, you know, there, there's really not. Katie Smith's a great player, but Cheryl just, just dominated and, and holds her records. I mean, holds the records for lots of things for the you know, NCAA tournament to this day. My focus was, I gotta win this game. Mm -hmm. You know, I, as, as an individual, I've gotta do what I have to do, what I'm capable of doing to win this game. Um, not just for myself, but for my teammates and my family in the city of Lubbock. I, I just remember having all these butterflies and, and I was nervous, but it was a good nervousness. Um, and I just remember when, when the buzzer sounded and, and it was tip-off time, 
You know, that was showtime for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Glenn Seal and Bill Seitzler from the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia, and we are getting set for the 1993 Women's National Championship between Texas Tech and Ohio State. You could tell right off the bat, Tech was faster. Tech was beating Ohio State to the spots on the floor where they needed to be. They were getting out and running. They were controlling the tempo. Seventeen for Katie Smith. The Lady Raiders did a pretty good job of shutting her down. She only scored 28 points, um, which would have tied a record for most points in a national championship game, but Cheryl Swoops bested her. I think Ohio State forgot to factor in Cheryl on that game. Swoops for three over Smith. Take that freshman. She just makes the game look too easy. You always had the feeling that Texas Tech was in control of this game. You, there was never a Oh, oh my gosh, moment. The score itself was not indicative of really how that game was won. I can promise you, at least the last two or three minutes, we, we knew we, we had a W, and it's just kind of maintaining it. Basketball, last time I checked, you simply did one more point than the other team. We hit some free throws down the stretch, Krista and I, and uh, it was just like, like I said, it was just like practice, you know, in the women's gym. We just had that mentality. And the pictures of me with our assistant coaches, with Lyndon and Roger, and all the things that were going on that bench. That was while the game was still being played because we knew that it was over. Victory is a two-point margin for the Lady Raiders of Texas Tech. And I'll never forget, I turned around and looked at the clock, I'm like, Tech beat Ohio State by two points. I'm like, oh my God, Cheryl, we did it! Texas Tech 84, um, Ohio State 82. And I said, yeah, we did it. We did it tears of joy and um, gosh it still brings back those tears it's crazy you couldn't there was no frame of reference so there was no right or wrong way to celebrate I guess and jumping up and down and hugging and crying and couldn't believe we just did what we did the celebration um, in Atlanta was crazy and it was fun and you know being able to experience that with friends and family um, but there was nothing like the the welcoming we got when we got back home. We knew during the national championship game that Lubbock was preparing some kind of welcome for the Lady Raiders. And I can remember in the second half uh, talking about it on the radio. They were saying if the Lady Raiders win, there's going to be a reception at Jones Stadium. I don't think anyone imagined that the crowd would be that large. We didn't know exactly what was waiting for us at all. We knew that they were going to have a welcome home, is what they had told us. I'm getting chills right now. It was That's something I'll never forget, um, just that feeling. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool. They put those kids in, in the limos. I'm, just, I'm sorry. But, uh, I guess this is what happens when you don't talk about it for 20 years, huh? T. Jones was the athletic director at the time, and he stands up on the plane, and we all look at him, and he goes, see those limos out there? Y'all need to get off the plane and go get in those limos. And then we had the rolling barricade all the way to the, to the stadium. And we just hear all this honking for no reason, and we're like, what's going on? And the limos, like, they've been doing this since yesterday, since y'all won the game. Within half a mile of Jones Stadium, you begin to hear cheers. And the hairs on the back of, of my neck began to stand up. And we rounded the corner, and you saw a glimpse of Jones Stadium. Coach Ray goes, that dang. I said, what's, what's the matter? I said, look. I said, look at the top of the stadium. It's filled with people, and we were all just about to die. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this place is full. I remember Michael going, is there a football game? And I was thinking, sweetheart, I think this is for us. Oh my gosh, just like that's a lot of people, so many people, I can't believe it. When we um, rolled into the stadium with 40,000 people there to greet us, I think that's when we just went, whoa, <laughs> look at what we've done. I stood up um, and poked my head out that sunroof, and I remember when we were going down through the tunnel how loud the sirens were on the motorcycles with the policemen. I mean, it was like, it was deafening, it was so loud. But the most amazing thing to me is once we got into the stadium. You can't hear the sirens anymore. And it was that loud. And uh, just unbelievable, unbelievable reception. An outlet for a community that just didn't know how to say thank you other than that. It was this huge, giant thank you card. 
and then a you know celebration of the party that it just it still defies imagination. So we rode, drove around and then got out and, and we got to speak to all of our fans. Reached deep inside and took their game to a totally different level. And they should be an example to all of us that if you have a great commitment, any dream you have can come true, even a national championship. And then of course Cheryl made her famous statement. We went down You know, you're getting an opportunity to celebrate with your, your friends and your family and your school and, and your city. And you know that all of these people are here um, for you and they're celebrating for you and they're happy for you. It was just such a, a, an incredible feeling. The support of the community and friends, family, it was, it was the most, one of the most amazing things that I've ever been a part of. I don't think there's ever a, a better welcome home than anybody could ever have. To, to know what it had meant to West Texas and to Lubbock and to Texas Tech, um, there was no doubt at that moment that it was such a big moment for all of us. Um, and when I say all of us, I'm talking about everybody um, in all of West Texas and Eastern New Mexico. Well, even 20 years down the road, you're thinking about, you realize how many people you really touched and how many people you won that for. But it wasn't about us, it was about Texas Tech and Lubbock and surrounding communities and, and for every team that puts on the Lady Raider uniform. Even to this day, many years later, um, I, don't, I don't really think of all the things I've accomplished, I don't really think I've had that particular type of a feeling um, that I had when we won the championship game. There's only one first title, there's only one first title, there's only one moment like that that can be shared within a program or even within a school. You want more, you want others, but there'll never be another moment like 1993. Mr. President, uh, thank you very much on behalf of all of us from Texas Tech for this tremendous honor. Uh, we felt like from the moment we won the national championship that the greatest reward anyone could give us would be to get to come to the White House. And uh, we know how busy you are and how full your schedule is. And uh, we just appreciate so much uh, you making our dreams come true today.